Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister Sanchez. So great to have you back in Davos. A warm welcome. It's uh, like um, welcoming back an old friend. And um, we know a lot has happened since uh, two and a half years since we last met in Davos. And um, your uh, role uh, in handling uh, the pandemic uh, in Spain and also transforming Spain's economy has been key. I think we all have studied with great interest your labor market and pension reforms. They could be an inspiration also for other countries and also that you are able to reinforce social rights and socioeconomic protection while improving uh, the business environment and overall Spain's competitiveness. You've shown it's possible to do both, to work for inclusiveness, but still have growth, uh, growth in your economy. So Europe is a major focus uh, at this annual meeting. And um, you've also been an advocate for Europe playing a stronger role in global affairs. And Spain has taken on an active role in the region under your leadership and also in the new geopolitical context and also related to Russia's totally unacceptable invasion of Ukraine, where you have been a leading voice. And Mr. Prime Minister, you will also be hosting probably the most consequential NATO summit in decades uh, in Madrid, uh, at least in Spain, uh, end uh, of June. We are so much looking forward uh, to hearing your speech and having a dialogue with you. So thank you and welcome back. Muchas gracias. The floor is yours, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, thank you, Borg, and uh, many thanks to the World Economic Forum for this opportunity uh, to address you today. It is both an honor and a pleasure to be back in Davos after the COVID-related uh, hiatus. My dear friends, I was still a teenager when the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the decade that uh, followed was uh, defined by Fukuyama thesis on the end of history, liberal democracy and the market economy had prevailed, and there was no way back. That ha that's how my generation grew up, thinking that economic growth, interconnectedness, uh, freedom of thought and speech and human progress were just as predictable as they were inevitable. Now, now in 2022, we know well that liberal democracy does not come naturally. It requires, it requires uh, considerable effort and nurturing. And the end of history is nowhere in sight. As I speak here to you today, Ukrainians are fighting for freedom and democracy, not just theirs, but also ours. We never thought that uh, we would see again such horrifying image of bombing and massacres on European soil. Names like Bucha or Mariupol have become synonymous of barbarity and war crimes that cannot go unpunished. I can only reaffirm the admiration that I, and I dare say all of those present here today, feel for the courage and the dignity of the Ukrainian men and women in the face of Putin's aggression, uh, brutal aggression. Today, Today, they, they embody the true defense of our common European values. This illegal, irrational, and unjust uh, war is uh, causing suffering and despair in Ukraine and beyond. We are witnessing the largest human exodus since the World War II, with over 6 million people fleeing the country and uh, uh, further 8 million internal, internally displaced people. But this is not just a, a local or even a European conflict. This is a major international crisis with consequences for all of us, regardless of where we come from. And we must be fully aware of what is ahead of us. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has triggered an unprecedented global food crisis with dramatic consequences for the most vulnerable countries, individuals and families. According to the UN, 1.7 billion people are at risk of poverty and hunger. The countries most dependent on food imports uh, face unprecedented uh, 
shortfalls uh, while their populations are suffering the effects of record uh, food prices. At the same time, some countries are adopting unilateral trade measures, uh, making it more difficult to meet uh, global demand. Food insecurity is a catalyst, uh, we know all of us, for social instability and often armed conflicts. Therefore, it is, I would say, imperative that we make every effort to restore fruit, fruit production and the trade system and achieve food security for the most vulnerable. And Spain will do its part. I want to take, my dear friends, uh, this opportunity to reaffirm uh, my country's uh, support for Ukraine and our resolve in helping ensure uh, that Putin does not achieve his goals. Spain has, as you said before, again set an example of solidarity. Ukraine can rest assured that we will welcome Ukrainian refugees in our country, now totaling well over 100,000 for as long as, it, uh, as needed. We will also continue to back, as we have done so far, the thoughtless sanctions against the, the Putin regime and providing humanitarian aid and assistance to Ukraine. Our support, our support is firm and unwearing because we know what is at stake. The territorial integrity of a sovereign country that lives, dreams and well-being of its citizens and the cause of international law, of liberal democracy and of course of the European Union. Make no mistake, Putin's uh, brutal aggression against Ukraine is also a direct act on the European Union and all, all it represents. By responding, by responding uh, with unity, as we did, and determination, the European Union is not only defending the basic principles of the international order, it is preserving the very values that underpin it since its foundation. Clearly, the last uh, couple of years have been not easy for the European project. First, Brexit, second, COVID, it is hard, it has hard, and now we have uh, to deal with the consequences of the war in Ukraine. However, the bigger challenge, the more resolute our reaction. Throughout these trying times, we always went for further integration, to unite and therefore not to divide, to make our common project, the European Union, stronger. We did it with uh, the joint purchase of vaccines, with a sure instrument for protecting jobs uh, during the pandemic and with the next generation funds. Now we are doing it again in our response to the war. With an unprecedented sanctions uh, designed to maximize long-term costs to the aggression and ensuring that Putin's vision for Russia and the world does not win from this war. Beyond, beyond helping our Ukrainian friends in their fight uh, for freedom and democracy, we are collectively moving in the direction of a greater uh, strategic autonomy. By deepening the single market, diversifying our supply chains, reducing our dependencies on energy, critical technologies, raw materials, semiconductors or health products, we are both becoming more resilient and accelerating our transition to a new economic and geopolitical reality that of the post-fossil fuel era. The same logic, my dear friends, guides the initiatives uh, to strengthen it, European defense. We want to reduce our strategic dependencies and invest not just more, but better, in increasing our security and defense capabilities. And we certainly must show the highest degree of ambition in promoting a renewed social agenda for the European Union. Because combating inequality and fostering social cohesion is the only way to achieve our goals of progress, prosperity, and welfare in the most efficient manner. In short, this is a road that we must travel together, and the war in Ukraine is yet another remind, reminder that we should do it without delay. My dear friends, of course, Russia's uh, aggression is altering uh, the uh, global economy, uh, economic outlook. We are coming out strong from the COVID crisis, but our economies have been severely impacted. From high energy prices fueling inflation to worsening uh, consumer sentiment and supply chain bottlenecks, Spain is obviously not immune to this shock. After devoting nearly 80 billion euros of public resources in 2020 and 2021, 
uh, to combat the impact of COVID-19 on our economy, we have recently approved a package of 16 billion euros to mitigate the effects of the Ukraine conflict on Spain's households, SMEs, and specific sectors. Since uh, well before the start of the war, and my government, the Spanish government, has been at the forefront of efforts to weather rising electricity prices across the European Union through temporary taxes cuts and subsidies. More recently, the European Council approved a 12-month price cap for the Albanian Peninsula on gas used to produce electricity, which will soon be implemented. This will allow us uh, to bring down prices, shielding households and their business uh, uh, from the extreme volatility and uh, potential price spikes in energy markets. Once again, we have uh, to fight against adversity, overcoming extreme external and predictable factors that have a major impact in, on, on our lives. Yet, there are inherent strengths uh, in the Spanish economy which give us reasons to be optimistic. The Spanish economy grew by 6.4% uh, year on year in the first quarter of, the 20, of 2022, and we estimate the growth uh, will reach 4.3% uh, for, uh, for the year, for 2022, one of the highest rates among advanced economies. Employment is up, the fiscal deficit is down, and two central sectors of our economy, the export sector and the tourism sector, are recovering the pre-COVID levels and are acting as the engines of this growth. In other words, we are containing the damage much better than other economies. Looking, looking at the medium and uh, to long-term outlook, uh, we believe the fundamentals of uh, the Spanish economy are even stronger. More importantly, the Spanish government has a clear roadmap for the modernization of uh, the country. Uh, let me highlight three key pillars of our vision. The first one is the implementation of the Next Generation European Recovery Plan. Last year, we launched an ambitious six-year, 70 billion euro recovery transformation and resilience plan that is already transforming our economy based on four fundamental drivers, the green transition, the digital transformation, social and co uh, territorial cohesion and gender equality. Now, I uh, can proudly say that Spain is by far, by far the country most advanced in everything related to the development uh, or deployment, sorry, of the uh, next generation European funds. We were the first country, along with uh, Portugal, to have our recovery plan approved by the European Commission, the first to receive a disbursement linked to the achievement of milestones and targets, and again, the first to request a second disbursement. And we are accelerating its implementation since the start of the war in Ukraine, because the answer to ending our dependence on Russian gas and oil lies uh, precisely in the decarbonization of our economy. But speed alone is not enough. We also have to put the money where it is most needed. With uh, this in mind, we have created an innovative instrument to enhance public-private collaboration, the strategic projects, or PERTES, as we call them. PERTES are born to become a driving force uh, for economic growth, employment, and the competitiveness of the Spanish economy. The, the, they are instruments for promoting and coordinating uh, high-priority complex investments in strategic sectors where state intervention is needed to supplement a uh, private initiative. They will channel more than 30 billion euros in public funds, 30 billion euros uh, in public funds, uh, and should mobilize around four times as much as private uh, funding. We are already, we are already approved, we have already approved, sorry, uh, 10 strategic projects in areas such as electric and connected vehicles. The car industry is very important for the Spanish economy. Renewable energy and uh, green hydrogen, water management, circular economy, health, aerospace sectors, among others. And precisely today, my government is approving a new landmark strategic project on microelectronics and semiconductors. With over 12 billion euros of public investments, we want to become the best partner for the industry in its efforts to expand uh, and diversify microchip uh, production to address growing demand and supply chain uh, disruption. Spain will not lose the race for the most advanced uh, technologies. Our country um, uh, wants to, to put uh, uh, at the forefront of industrial and technological projects uh, and, and the strategic projects uh, on semiconductors province. 
The second pillar is the ambitious reform agenda that my government has put uh, in motion to address the structural problems of our economy. It consists of over 100 structural reforms based on the European Commission's specific recommendations for Spain and linked to our recovery plan. Let me highlight three areas where we are concentrating our efforts. First, green transition and the fight against climate change. We are challenging uh, 30 billion euros, 40% of Spain's next generation funds for the decarbonization of our economy. These investments are coupled with ambitious reforms to fight against climate change and boost circular economy, self-consumption and sustainable mobility. By making the best possible use of our natural resources and investing heavily uh, in the technologies of the future, from green hydrogen to energy storage and clean vehicles, I think Spain wants to position uh, ourselves as, uh, as a global sustainable uh, uh, leader or sustainability leader. Second, the digital transformation. Our digital agenda has an all-encompassing vision from digital skills to cybersecurity, from the digitalization of SMEs to a sound cloud policy, from 5G connectivity to artificial intelligence. And third, education and talent attraction. Because we, we know the human capital is the engine that drives economic growth. We are reforming our education system from top to, to bottom, from boosting preschool education to a major expansion and modernization of our vocational training system, from university reform to a new science law that will provide adequate incentives and double the amount of funding to research, development, and innovation. And finally, as an overarching pillar of our reform agenda, we set our sights on the provision of quality stable employment. Thanks to a labor market reform negotiated and agreed by employers and trade union, um, Spain is well on track to correct uh, the endemic defects of its labor market, which are precariousness and temporality. With the previous law, only once one in 10 new contracts were permanent. Today, there is one new permanent contract uh, for every uh, new temporary contract. The job creation rate is at 5% year on year. Both, both uh, youth and women's uh, unemployment rates are decreasing at a steady pace. And uh, for the first time in history, there are over 20 million employed people in Spain. More public investments are better the education, more jobs and better jobs. In short, more opportunities for everyone uh, to thrive. Because the best political or social policy is uh, one that combines quality employment opportunities uh, for society as a whole with a strong welfare state that protects those in need. And these are not just receipts for a country like Spain. It will, it, it, we truly want to preserve a way of life that has been an aspiration for hundreds of millions of people. This means quality, of jo quality jobs for everyone. This means economic opportunity for everyone. But it also means fighting against tax avoidance and unfair tax practices, both at home and abroad. It means being brave enough to truly provide the opportunities that emerging economies desperately look for. We should not be afraid to truly invest in the human development of these communities, go beyond the financing of infrastructure projects, crucial as they are. Long-term engagement and inclusivity are the best possible medicine against authoritarianism and nativism, both at home, among our citizens, and elsewhere. My dear friends, what we are witnessing is not just a reminder that history did not end three decades ago. We are witnessing the end of the age of naivety. We are now seeing how our values, those our societies are built upon, need to be defended. Putin's frontal, frontal attack reminds us that the future is uh, a land to be conquered. There's nothing, there's nothing inevitable about the rise of extremism and tyranny. On the contrary, there are, or there is a clear chance for the values of democracy, freedom, and international law to continue to thrive. It is uh, time to feel confident in ourselves. Let us not fear the forces uh, that threaten uh, the, to derail the future with the terror and hate. We have the most powerful weapons 
if we use them wisely. Because democracy, multilateralism, may get messy, noisy, imperfect on occasion, but we know they are the only road to peace and freedom in the long term. George Orwell once famously, uh, famously wrote, and I quote, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. My final message for you today is that we must be brave about the present, not to control the past, but to earn the future. The time for complacency is over. If we stay determined, reason, freedom, and democracy shall prevail. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Prime Minister uh, Sanchez, for this uh, very uh, important um, speech. Um, I really liked how much you also focused on values, saying that the values our societies are built on have to be defended. And uh, make no mistake, uh, you also said to Mr. Putin and Russia, um, what we're seeing unfolding now in Ukraine is a direct attack on the liberal democracies. I'm so glad that we have leaders like you in Europe standing up for uh, these values, and you also addressed the strategic autonomy concept in Europe. That has been uh, about um, supply chains, it's been about the single market, but um, I guess that um, this is also more now about security and defense. And how do you see the European Union developing uh, on those topics, on the strategic autonomy, on defense and security? Does Europe need to step up and take more responsibility for its own defense and security and not uh, relying um, also so much on external partners? Well, th th thanks uh, for, for your words. Uh, just um, uh, a quick um, comment. Uh, I think that uh, it is also very important to uh, share with our partners um, uh, abroad, uh, I mean abroad the European Union and the Western, uh, I would say, community, that this uh, uh, challenge that uh, Putin is uh, 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 tabling affects uh, all the world. And this is a global crisis and it is important to isolate uh, Putin's uh, uh, in the international community, and this is something that we are, you know, uh, doing um, uh, with uh, conversations that we have. Uh, in my case, with many leaders in Latin America, because I think it's very important to uh, keep in mind that this is a global challenge. Uh, just to remind that uh, Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and what is now at stake is the international order that he is not. Uh, you know, fulfilling or respecting. But uh, going to uh, your question on uh, strategic autonomy, I think that uh, Spain was, uh, together with Holland, the first country to launch a known paper uh, uh, to define what are the uh, characteristics of uh, this uh, new, uh, uh, let's say, expression, uh, strategic autonomy. And just uh, give uh, some, uh, some quick ideas. The first one is open strategic autonomy. This is not to uh, foreclose in the European Union uh, to implement a, a new uh, protectionism uh, economic policy. Uh, uh, it is the contrary. I think it's very important to uh, open uh, uh, European Union to, to create new ties on trade uh, with uh, all the regions. Uh, for instance, why not with Europe, Latin America? I think this is also very important and this is a huge opportunity for the European Union. So open a, a, a strategic autonomy. Second, I think that not, not, because, uh, not only because of the war, but also because of the pandemic, the Europeans, we realized that uh, we need to reduce many vulnerabilities that we have. For instance, on health products. Uh, and that is why I think it's important to reduce our vulnerabilities and to increase our resilience. Uh, health products, of course, energy, uh, raw materials, semiconductors, microelectronics, and, as you mentioned before, uh, defense. And I would just uh, like to add uh, regarding defense in this uh, uh, reflection on uh, strategic autonomy, I think it's important the, the complementary vision between the European Union and NATO. 
I think that one of the biggest mistakes that uh, Putin uh, has uh, made is to underestimate the reaction of NATO and the European Union. And uh, before the war, before the invasion, there were very important uh, actors uh, reflecting on what to do with, the, with NATO. And I think that we realize how important it is uh, to keep uh, this strong ally, alliance between our partners uh, uh, in the US, Canada, and other parts of the world. So, you know, we're very excited to, to host this very important meeting in Madrid uh, next uh, June. And I think it's going to uh, be um, a very important message uh, for the international community, especially for, for Putin, that uh, NATO and the European Union uh, reinforce uh, our allies. No, thank you for so strongly underlining also the importance of the transatlantic uh, relationship. And you will be hosting yes. the NATO summit, as I also said at the introduction, probably the most important NATO summit uh, in decades. So what do you expect as uh, outcomes of the summit? Well, I think that uh, the, the first and the main uh, outcome of the summit would be uh, the unity. Unity among allies, unity between NATO and the European Union. Uh, for instance, we are working um, and preparing uh, uh, an informal uh, dinner between uh, member states of the European Union and the NATO allies, which some of them are not uh, included in, in, in NATO, as you know. Second, I think it's important to define our uh, strategic uh, concept, which is, uh, you know, the, the strategy for NATO uh, over the next uh, years. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, until uh, 2030, uh, sorry. And uh, in, uh, from, 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 from us, from, from Spain, it, it will be very important to have a strong message uh, on the southern flank. Uh, it is important, of course, uh, to... Um, uh, to face the challenge on the eastern flank that Putin is, you know, tabling. But I think it's also very important uh, to keep in mind this uh, uh, 360 degrees strategy of NATO and to develop this idea uh, with a strong message of the southern flank uh, security concerns that we are also facing in some sub-Saharan countries. And uh, finally, uh, of course, we are uh, going to welcome two new countries. Uh, in, uh, in NATO, and, uh, and of course, I think this is also very important for the European Union uh, stability and, and for, for the NATO uh, future. So, so Finland and Sweden will be there in Madrid? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> and, and you see, as President Biden, you, you see a clear track for them for membership? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I can only speak uh, from, uh, you know, as Prime Minister of Spain, but uh, so far, I think that the ambience and the, or the environment uh, and, the, of course, the, uh, uh, the political will of, of uh, the allies is to welcome these two countries. And, of course, in Spain, we are going to accelerate all the parliamentary uh, process in order to uh, fulfill with uh, our commitment uh, with these two countries that are, of course, very important, not only for NATO, but also for the European Union stability. There are uh, big democracies, very well-established and consolidated democracies, uh, and, uh, and of course, I think it's also very important for NATO and the European Union to have them on board as NATO allies. Well, thank you. And um, I wanted to come back to um, also the reforms that you are undertaking uh, in Spain. Uh, you're not complacent when it comes to climate change and the green transformation, mm. also the new technologies and also uh, the labor uh, reforms. So what is the success uh, recipe behind uh, the rebooting of the Spanish economy because uh, unemployment is going down, um, you also see more investments, growth is back, yeah. and you have also been able to do this uh, with launching uh, new reforms. Uh, many economists say it's not possible to start with those uh, labor reforms and pension reforms at the, and then create growth. First, you have to do the growth, but you have combined this. Can other countries learn from your example? Well, we, we are happy to share our, our experience with uh, the rest of the countries, but uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, the economic response uh, from the European Union during the pandemic was outstanding because there was actually a, an alignment 
between the monetary policy and the fiscal policy. And this is something that we have to keep in mind when we regard uh, and we face these, uh, the terrible consequences of, of, uh, of the war uh, for Europe. Second, I think that um, it is important uh, the, 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 the political uh, message that we send uh, with the uh, mutualization of uh, the debt at a uh, European scale, because that provides uh, uh, countries like Spain and others uh, the means, the instruments to uh, uh, transform and modernize our economy. For instance, on green transition, as you mentioned before, and of course, the digital transformation of our economy, our uh, enterprises, and of course, citizens. And this is something that we are profiting. Uh, we are profiting uh, on investment, but also on uh, reforming uh, our educational system, as I mentioned before, our energy system, or of course, um, um, uh, um, I would say the uh, uh, public administration uh, reform. And, and, and of course, uh, labor reform and pension reform. On labor reform, I think that the outcome uh, and the figures that we are now witnessing on the Spanish economy are very impressive and very positive. And it also gives uh, reasons to those of us that really defend that there's no a trade-off between uh, job creation and quality of jobs. At the end of the day, one of the major challenges that mm, my uh, economy, my country, Spain, uh, has is uh, to increase productivity. And productivity is related, of course, to uh, precariousness and temporality. And this is something that we are um, uh, facing with this uh, uh, new uh, labor reform, which, by the way, was agreed uh, with, uh, and, um, uh, with the employers and, and the trade unions. And I'm uh, always thankful for, uh, thankful for the um, uh, commitment uh, with their country uh, in, in very difficult moments as, as the ones that we uh, faced uh, with the pandemic and now with the war. I think it's also a question of the legitimacy of a social market economy that also wealth trickles down. Because we have seen growth, but uh, the legitimacy is also based on, on inclusion. But coming back to... Uh, absolutely, and I think it's also very important to keep in mind that uh, sometimes politics is uh, overestimated. It's very important to have the uh, private sector on board. I think one of the major lessons that we learned from the pandemic and nowadays with the war is the need to uh, create this public and private partnership. This is what we are doing uh, when we are, uh, you know, uh, creating these uh, strategic projects, the purpose, uh, because uh, indeed, uh, at the end of the day, the private sectors also need the, the commitment from the public uh, administration. And this is something that I'm, you know, very uh, uh, thankful uh, to the private sector, many of the companies that are here uh, in, in Davos. And uh, I think that, you know, we have uh, good um, fundamentals, uh, very strong fundamentals, sorry, and this is also uh, thanks to uh, the participation of our employers and uh, big uh, companies uh, of our economy. Well, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. I think you're preaching to uh, the choir, but you're also walking the talk because we have seen uh, the pow power of uh, public-private uh, cooperation on climate change. We're seeing companies now pledging to go net zero, companies also taking the ESGs very central. I think more and more companies also see if you want to attract talent, you have to be in the forefront of uh, these very important uh, values. And I think it's also very important to reaffirm this commitment today. Because perhaps for some leaders, this uh, war could uh, be used as an excuse not to fulfill with their commitments on climate. And this is also something that we have to keep in mind. And uh, definitely Spain is uh, committed with these uh, climate goals, with the Agenda 2030, and uh, of course uh, with uh, the mitigation and adaptation to this global threat, which is uh, climate change. We shall not forget that for climate change, we don't have a vaccine. And uh, for that, we need to strengthen multilateralism and of course uh, not to uh, forget the biggest threat that we have uh, ahead of us. No, thank you so much for underlining that, you know, no vaccine against climate change. That's going to be hard work and decoupling yes. uh, and also introducing uh, the freedom fuels. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think you're, you're doing well on the freedom fuels. 
Yes, actually, well, I think that uh, since, uh, I mean, we started four years ago, uh, together with the enterprises, with the private sector, to, uh, uh, to draw um, and to imagine an energy transition in Spain. Um, I think that we are, you know, we have the, we have the fundamentals, we have the, 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 the means, and uh, the only thing that um, we didn't have four years ago was the, uh, the political, the strong political commitment to face this green transition. But nowadays, uh, last year, 57% of our uh, uh, installed capacity uh, is renewed, renewable. So I think it's, you know, it also shows the commitment of, of, uh, of Spain, uh, its society, and of course, the, the Spanish government. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Prime Minister, for your commitment uh, to the values uh, for liberal democracies, uh, also for your reforms. Thank you for coming back. Thank you. thank you for also being a leader in the green field. It's always a pleasure to have you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back.